In our previous video lecture, we learned a little bit about motor control, specifically how to control stepper motors. In this lab, we're going to learn how to control DC motors using pulse width modulation, and specifically we'll learn about the PWM module that is part of timer 2 on board the PIC 16F887. So before we begin, let's learn a little bit about how DC motors work and some of the limitations of using them with a digital logic controller. So one of the problems with digital controllers such as microcontrollers is that they are designed to be low power devices which means they can source very little current um, directly from the pins. So what we typically do is we use a motor driver circuit which can take a low current digital output and can effectively translate that into a higher current signal that can be used to drive a motor or other high current uh, devices. So a transistor based motor driver circuit can take in the digital logic that we send it and then it can create or remove certain pathways for higher current to flow. So let's look at an example of one such device. This is about the simplest transistor based motor driver circuit that you would see. In this case your motor would be the load here and we know that our load is acting effectively as an inductor. It is serving as an electromagnet. That's how most motors um, give rise to their torque. And so we have our VG here and that can be our gate voltage which is going into this field effect transistor that we have right here. And so this gate voltage, depending upon whether it's high or low, causes this transistor to act essentially as either an open circuit or a short. And so if it is acting as a short, then current can flow, this ID, from this source up here all the way down through the load to ground. If this is acting as an open circuit, then there is no closed loop path to ground and thus the load does not receive enough current for it to give rotation. This flyback diode here is designed to protect the diode so as we remember we cannot have instantaneous current changes. So even if your voltage here changes and it will instantaneously change or, or very nearly instantaneously change that is driving your gate which could in turn cause very quick changing on your field effect transistor your load cannot as quickly change current so what happens is your current will instead of flowing this way through the transistor have a path to escape over here through the flyback diode so that flyback diode prevents damage to your motor and is a very important component so hopefully you have heard about pulse width modulation and you may remember pulse width modulation from your freshman classes when you were using the Bobots and trying to program up servo motors. But in case you've forgotten, pulse width modulation relies upon the square wave or the duty cycle of a square wave signal. And so you are going to output a square wave that will have a certain period and the ratio of the time high of that period to the overall period will be the duty cycle. And the higher your duty cycle, the closer it is to 100%, the faster your motor will run, and the closer it is to 0%, the slower that motor will run. So here you can see some examples of varying pulse width modulated signals that could come through. So if you had a duty cycle of 10%, that would indicate a motor typically operating at about one-tenth of its maximum speed. And you notice that the ratio of the time it is high to the time that it is low in every period is relatively low. It's 1 to 10, 10 percent. Here we see 30 percent, here we see 50 percent, so that's about half speed. Here we see 90 percent. And so the pulse width is how long you are high and the overall period is the total time you are high and low combined in any given cycle. So that ratio there expressed as a percentage is your duty cycle. So with the PIC there are a few different ways that you can generate a pulse width modulated signal. In one case you could just choose any of your digital pins to serve as an output 
And then you could simply turn on that bit, delay for however long you want it to remain high, turn off the bit, and then delay for however long you want it to be uh, low. So that, in this case, would be the period minus the time that it was high. And then you could just loop through for however many periods of the pulse width modulated signal that you want. And so that's a pretty surefire way just to uh, control a motor. But the problem is that it takes some processor resources to toggle those bits on and off. And while you're delaying, you can't really do a whole lot of other things while you're generating that pulse width modulated signal. You can't be checking other sensors. If you do, you might end up slowing down your PWM signal or missing a toggle, which could cause your motor to behave erratically. So the good news is there is a way to automate the pulse width modulated signal. And this will rely upon our timer two module. So we can use timer two to generate a PWM on our CCP1 uh, output, which happens to also be the same pin as RC2. So if you are using this to control motors, you are using that output, then you will not be able to use anything else that happens to be operating on RC2, such as your keypad. So we can't use the keypad at the same time we're using PWM to drive a motor. There's several different registers that we're going to have to use to configure pulse width modulation on timer 2. So previously we've talked about timer 0, we've talked very briefly about timer 1. We haven't gotten much into timer 2 largely because it's a little bit more complicated. There's more bits to deal with. So there are four registers that you see there, PR2, CCP R1L, T2 CON, and CCP1 CON that we will use to configure our pulse width modulated signal. So let's look at how each of those registers work and what you need to write to each of those. So PR2 allows us to determine the period of each of those pulse width modulated signals. And as you can see, there is a formula here for how you can compute the period that you want. And so what happens is your timer 2 is going to increase from 0 one at a time. It's going to increment one at a time until it reaches whatever value you set in PR2. So it's going to increment for a smaller amount of time if you have a lower value. The default value is FF in hexadecimal, so it would go all the way from 0 up through 255. So if you have a larger value in there, such as the default FF, it's going to take longer to go, otherwise it's going to take a shorter time to go. So whatever time you put in PR2 plus 1 multiplied by 4, times the period of the oscillator signal, which for our oscillator is going to be 1 over 4 megahertz, or about a quarter of a microsecond, times whatever you put in your timer 2 prescale value. So you can choose that to be 1 to 1, or you can choose it to be even slower. So in this case, your 4 times TOSC, this works out to be 1 microsecond. So the overall period is going to be PR2 plus 1 times 1 microsecond times whatever you put in your prescale value. So if you choose that to be 1 to 1, then your overall period is just going to be in microseconds, the value in PR2 plus 1. CCP R1L and CCP1 CON are used to configure the duty cycle. So with PR2 we configure the period. Now within that period we can determine how High, how long we want it to be high and how long we want it to be low as a percentage. So the least significant bits of this, uh, CC, this uh, duty cycle are in CCP1 con bits 5 and 4 and the most significant bits, most significant 8 bits are in CCP R1L and those are going to be the bits we really care about. Once you start getting into the ninth and 10th bit those are relatively insignificant in terms of your uh, duty cycle. So your most significant bit is worth 50%, your second most is worth 25%, your third is going to be 12 and a half, your fourth is going to be on the order of about six, then you're going to get on the order of about three for your fifth bit, um, somewhere between one and a half and two. You're going to be getting down to these least significant bits being worth less than 
duty cycle. And so they're really not going to make that much of a difference. Typically, we'll just set them to zero for our purposes. Then, in order to use the pulse width modulated signal, we also, within CCP1 con, bits 3 through 0, we want to set up a 1-1, one, one, and then the next two bits determine which pulse width modulation we're using. But specifically for all of the pulse width modulated signals, we want these two bits to be a 1, and we're going to just use 1-1-0-0 one, one, zero, zero for that. That will allow us to have our proper pulse width modulated signal. So once we have our duty cycle and our period established, there's also one more register that we need to deal with, and this is our timer prescale right here. So if you want one to one, you just put zero, zero. If you want four, um, so that is multiplying that delay by four, then you put zero, one, and if you want 16, you just put one, and then it doesn't matter what you put for the other bit in bit zero and one. To turn this timer on, which obviously we will want to do in order to use the pulse width modulated signal, you need to put a 1 to bit 2. And then for your post scaler, we're just going to set that to 0, uh, or set that to 1 to 1. So we're just going to put 0 in all of the bits 6 through 3. And bit 7 is not used, so you don't have to write anything to that. You can just leave that as a 0. CCP1 con determines which mode of pulse width modulation we're going to be using. We will be using an H bridge, but for our purposes, for this simple lab that we're going to be doing this week, we are going to just use the single output mode. So what that will do is it will just output a single pulse width modulated signal. We will use that to drive a motor forward. We're not going to worry about outputting another pulse width modulated signal to drive the motor in reverse on another channel. So for this, we're just going to output a single output PWM. So inside of your CCP1 con, bits 7 and 6 should just be zeros. And then bits 3 through 0, we'll just put 1100 zero, zero for the PWM mode. This is the H-bridge circuit um, that is typically used to drive a motor. So we see the motor here in the middle. These are effectively the same as those transistor motor driver circuits that we saw before, but now we have four such transistors. And these typically work in pairs. So if you put your source voltage up here, let's say you had a 12 volt DC motor, you'd put 12 volts up here, you'd put ground down here, and that 12 volt signal gives potential so that you could have current flowing, and that could flow over here. If you activated this transistor, then you would have a short circuit path through here and then it could go through the motor and then if you shorted this transistor down here by activating this input then you would have a pathway here through the motor and then through this transistor to ground which would give rise to rotation in one direction if you wanted to give rise to rotation in the other direction you would do the exact opposite and on 3 and 2 you would activate those and then the current would flow the exact opposite direction. And so the direction of current is going to determine whether your motor is going clockwise or counterclockwise. And so you can change that uh, just by activating different transistors. In our case we are going to be using a half H driver, the SN754410. You're going to get a separate chip in class and you are going to wire up a simple circuit and we will use this with the power supplies that we happen to have in the lab. So you're not going to be able to get enough current to drive the motors that we're using on the board just off of your USB port so we're going to use an external DC power supply and you're going to put in your digital logic based on outputs from your PIC microcontroller. So we're going to put in the control logic from the PIC microcontroller and that will amplify the voltage and in turn the current um, basically by translating from a low current, low voltage digital circuit into a higher current, higher voltage uh, potential and source coming from the power supply in the lab.
It's very important that you don't mistake VCC1 and VCC2 on there. VCC1 is your logic voltage, so that is your 5 volts, and you can get that right off of your um, pow the power pins inside of your trainer kit. And then VCC2 is going to be the motor voltage. That's going to be 12 volts, which you will supply from the DC power supply in the lab. You have four different uh, transistors, and you can enable them independently, at least in pairs. So one and two can be enabled, three and four can be enabled, and in order to drive one motor, we typically will just disable one of those two pairs. So typically we'll disable three and four, and then you can connect your PWM signal to input 1A. So that's going to be basically determining how fast your motor gets turned on and off and basically gets connected to or how fast it gets connected to its voltage uh, supply. The motor is going to be connected to 1Y and 2Y. Those are going to be your outputs. And for more information on this chip, you can see the data sheet that is posted to Blackboard.